All right. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, I see our, our invited guest speaker is already online. I'm just going to kindly ask if you can if you can hear me. Yes, can hear you. Ah, you. Loud and clean. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, Travis. By the way, we typically have um, the, the core, um, the core audience for the for the seminar series. Uh, colleagues that I enrolled into, I, I think, like 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 I mentioned in in our interaction you know, or correspondence. Um, colleagues that I enrolled into a postgraduate um, course called uh, data mining and warehousing. And so this, this course ideally is associated with the Master of uh, Science in Computer Science program offered in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, but in addition to that, we extend um, uh, invitations to you know, undergraduate students and, and also uh, postgraduate students that are pursuing uh, information science centric uh, programs. So, because I happen to play an active role in in uh, one such program, so the Master of Library Information Science program. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send um, send a reminder to the core audience uh, because I can only see. I think I only see like four people present, and it turns out, by the way, that they. So attendance and participation from our colleagues in 5741 uh, counts towards the um, the the grade, the final grade, right? So it counts towards the continuous assessment score. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly send uh, yet another reminder to them via WhatsApp. I mean, I know I sent an email. So just uh, give me a minute or two, please. Thanks. No problem. I'm ready with you. All right. Um, I, I think I think we can start. It's almost seventeen thirty-five. Uh, we we are dealing with very busy people. I know Travis is a very busy person, right? Um, again, Travis, thank you so much for for agreeing to be a part of this. Um, especially that uh, you know it's pro bono work, right? There's no compensation, sadly. Um, <laughs> but we've always thought that this is. I, I think it's part of the greater good, right? Uh, we are. Uh, hopefully implicitly making a positive impact insofar as the goings on in Zambia are concerned. But anyway, so um, thanks again, everyone, for taking the time off to attend the, uh, the talk. So today's speaker is uh, Travis Mlinga. Um, and Travis is going to give a talk titled Top uh, KPIs or Key Performance Indicators for uh, Telecom Operators or med uh, Mobile Network Operators, as they're commonly called, MNOs. Um, so Travis is an internationally experienced telecoms, media, and tech practitioner with vast customer, commercial, and operations experience. He's uh, presently the uh, 
the CEO and principal consultant for Travis Paul Consulting. Um, and in the recent past, Travis has worked for entities such as uh, uh, Multi-Choice Africa, uh, Airtel Zambia, and the Nielsen Company. Um, I, I, and, and actually, I, I had an interesting conversation with Travis. Um, when I was looking up his LinkedIn profile, surprised that uh, he's left Multi-Choice. I think he was telling me that uh, he left, uh, must have been in April or something, it could be wrong here. But um, just to also mention that uh, I've, I've interacted with, I've been interacting with Travis since uh, my days at UNSA. Uh, in 2003 it was. Uh, Travis and I were lab partners. And then lo and behold, when I joined Airtel, uh, I think I found Travis already working for the marketing department. And I think the stars aligned because when I was working in IT, part of what I used to do involved uh, harvesting information or collecting information that you know, uh, Travis's team, the marketing team and sales team would actually use to launch these campaigns and all the exciting things that happened or that used to happen in the telecommunications sector. So Travis, without uh, further ado, uh, please, the floor is, uh, is yours. Um, generally, we tend to invite questions from people at the end of the presentation. Um, so ex expect questions. I, I know a lot of people have a vested interest in this. Everybody uses uh, a phone, right, to communicate with people. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lighton. I think um, your introduction of me was even better than my own. So I would not say uh, much more. I'll just get into our subject matter. So in terms of uh, mobile network operators, we are mainly focusing and specializing on those that deal with uh, mobile infrastructure. That means your phone is not uh, tethered to a fixed position. You can uh, move and uh, be as free as possible. So we have um, uh, this presentation is basically around uh, uh, KPIs, which is uh, key performance indicators. So I uh, just want to give uh, a brief overview for those of us that have not been fortunate enough to work for uh, MNOs. Uh, what exactly do you find when you're working? What exactly are you expected to know as basics? And uh, beyond that, as things get more advanced and you have uh, more expertise, uh, what else can you look for in terms of uh, creating um, future uh, uh, wavy uh, products, uh, campaigns, or initiatives? So um, we we'll skip this part uh, as it was done very well by Lighton, and we'll go straight into um, the first uh, area. And uh, when it comes to KPIs, uh, basically, subscribers are those people that are actually using the service, whether it's uh, a free subscription or a paid subscription, or, uh, or it is uh, paid for by maybe, say, uh, viewing an advert. So in terms of uh, total subscribers, that would be the whole entire universe of everyone who is active or inactive. And that becomes a key number that is tracked on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. And then um, as um, the discussions around how to manage uh, these particular customers go around, segmentation is used. So usually the two common uh, sub-segments are prepaid and postpaid, which basically means uh, prepaid are those customers that are going to only enjoy the service uh, before uh, after they've paid for and postpaid are able to go and use the service and they get a bill at the end of the month, which allows them to uh, continuously use the service. Should they fall off or anything like that, should they stop paying, they are disconnected. Uh, similar thing to prepaid, they also get disconnected based on whether they're active or not active. And then the uh, third most important uh, KPI is uh, chain. When we talk about chain, we are basically looking at customers who we can count to say they used to be a part of the total subscriber base, but uh, due to either inactivity or they've chosen to disconnect uh, their account, they are no longer a part of that. So that percentage of customers is uh, 
usually sits around three to five percent and uh, it's sort of tracked on a daily basis and managed proactively by running different initiatives that make sure that customers are staying active and they do not become inactive or even if um, they are active in some parts of uh, the month uh, or the day you find ways and means to ensure that they are active most of the entire time so that you can maximize the revenue that uh, uh, you get from those customers. And then um, you can also think of something like subscriber pay employee. So for instance, if you have uh, a thousand employees and uh, you are looking at uh, how many uh, customers that translates to pay employee uh, in terms of whether they support effort or anything um, in terms of revenue, you can also use that KPI. On the far right, I've put in uh, segmentation. Uh, basically, uh, out of your sub-segments, which is prepaid and postpaid, you have uh, other ways and means in which you can dissect and uh, analyze the base so that you understand where your customers are sitting, what device they are using, whether or not um, they are uh, using a basic phone like a feature phone or a smartphone, or they just use a router or a MiFi. And then um, that in itself presents to you uh, key insights in terms of understanding whether or not you are actually maximizing the lifetime value of your customers because within these particular segments you can either migrate or upgrade customers or you can prevent them from downgrading to ensure that you are managing the best and getting the most in terms of subscribers that are active as well as the revenue that is generated on a daily basis other uh, Examples of uh, segmentation include value-based segmentation. With value-based segmentation, this is basically where you uh, aggregate the data points in terms of your distribution of how much value you get from customers. Uh, value being, of course, the revenue that they generate and the number of customers. So the two are uh, cross-tapped and then you sort of uh, come up with the brackets that you can define. You can define from uh, 0 to 10 quarter, 10 to 20, 20 to 50 quarter, 50 to 100, 100 and above. So once you get a map of where your base is sitting, you can also overlay it with other uh, forms of segmentation, be it device, uh, be it uh, prepaid, be it uh, the location, or be it be in um, any psychographic data that you have. For instance, now there's a lot of KYC data so you can uh, as well pick up whether the person is male or female or whether or not uh, they are in a particular age group. And um, when it comes to um, uh, activity-based segmentation, we are basically looking at um, the activity uh, that I mentioned. So when the customer is active, they fall within a certain number of days in which they're active. If they're entirely active in, in uh, the period that you're looking at, whether that's a month or on a daily basis, you can say that is an active customer. If uh, at some point they are inactive uh, for say one to seven days, you can group them accordingly and you put together the trunks of um, the uh, groups that you have up to even uh, 360 days if that's what you want to do. So overall uh, segmentation should at least allow you to do a particular action. So when it comes to value, mostly the use case is to make sure that you maximize the value from the customer, which is the activity and the revenue. When it comes to uh, location, you might be interested, for instance, in knowing of the 10 provinces in Zambia, where do we get the most value? And then how do we then manage and ensure that we are leaders in that particular area? Or if we are lagging behind, what initiatives do we customer service? so that for those particular customers, they are managed differently and you give them a differentiated offer. Examples of some of these things is uh, maybe you've heard of uh, things like MTN Zone or Airtel um, uh, had another initiative where you could see a discount on your phone based on the location. If you move to another site, you find that maybe you have a uh, higher discount. If you move to a different site, you get a different discount. And also uh, lastly, in terms of segmentation, you get things like uh, data usage. So for instance, um, you can have um, 
a smartphone that has a small screen and doesn't pull as much data. It might be 3G, it might be 4G. And then based on the usage that can actually be uh, calculated and uh, then tabulated in different bands, you then group customers accordingly. Okay. So um, after subscribers, the thing I've been mentioning is value. And to actually determine value, we we'll look at it uh, basically by looking at uh, the revenue. Um, usually, uh, telecoms providers start out with um, expansion of their network infrastructure, and then they move on and acquire customers so that those customers are coming um, onto their network. That happens is um, there's uh, also considerable investment in terms of subscriber acquisition costs, uh, where you give minutes on new SIM cards, etc. But as time goes by, a customer has uh, developed uh, a sort of spending pattern. It's also developed um, a, the behavior that you are looking for to encourage. One of the most important uh, KPIs is average revenue per user. This is basically the total revenue that uh, is uh, computed within a different period. And then given the number of customers that are uh, generating that revenue, you do um, a ratio, and that ratio tells you whether or not uh, you are within um, the guidelines or the budgeted uh, target that you have. And this is tracked uh, across maybe even other sub-segments, whether it's voice, data, or aggregated. And you also have prepaid and postpaid, and then the blended. Basically, when you blend the two, it means uh, you take uh, the average of each and then come up with um, some sort of uh, 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 weight average that can give you an indication whether you are on course. Um, other KPIs that you have is how much revenue is generated per call, uh, per sale site. Uh, a sale site is basically at each tower, there's a number of sales that are pointing in different directions. Each one of them is pulling um, and acquiring as um, a wealth of customer data in terms of voice, data usage, and location information. So you put all that together to compute which uh, sales are performing better. You put together all the different sales sites and all the different sites um, in a particular area or a town, which are mapped uh, and then also pointed uh, towards a geographic plan. You can then track the revenue uh, the same. Um, and just uh, another key consideration is in terms of revenue breakup, uh, uh, MNOs have sort of uh, transitioned in Zambia. Previously, a lot of revenue used to be postpaid. Now, uh, the bulk of customers are prepaid. Uh, uh, prior, there were things like connection fees. Before you set up a call, you would pay, for example, a one quarter or a ten ingwe. Now those things are no longer there. So you now have uh, very much combo bundles and those have been designed with the idea of maximizing revenue, given that the market has now uh, pretty much advanced. So if you look at um, the revenue that comes from uh, these customers now, it's basically subscription, subscription to minutes, uh, data, voice. These combo bundles uh, in aggregate, they give you a revenue figure, which is then tracked on a daily basis. And you also have uh, data, uh, um, which is purely uh, transmission data, which is moved, uh, moving data from one point to another. You also have uh, wireless voice, you have uh, internet, we have interconnect and also roaming. Um, interconnect is basically how much each of the operators charge each other for connecting uh, customers on either network. So there is a certain amount of revenue that is uh, charged uh, for each call and uh, each operator ends as much as they are able to support the others. So there's a net of effect that comes into play. And for those particular daily transactions or monthly transactions, uh, you need a BI, a, a strong and agile BI team that is able to actually deliver those particular reports and be able to operate more effectively in the market. And there's also roaming. Roaming simply means if I can travel, for instance, to another country, I should be able to connect and pay. This usually comes in at a higher fee than you would pay local, uh, locally. So you have um, different agreements with different uh, operators in different countries. 
So you might find that if you go to South Africa, you probably connect, uh, if you're an MTN customer, you probably connect uh, automatically to MTN. But if you have, um, say, Airtel, you have more of a choice and you can choose any operator there, whether it's Vodafone, whether it's uh, CLC, whether it's MTN, or any others that are available. So basically the revenue is tracked on a daily basis and uh, the other use uh, departments is finance who also must account for the revenue. The other uh, uses of this revenue is that it's also used to track the business performance on a daily basis so that uh, you're tracking versus budget, you're tracking versus targets, and you're also just basically tracking to see whether you're running an efficient and profitable business. Okay, and uh, go now to uh, usage. Uh, when we talk about usage, basically we are trying to understand the behavior in terms of what exactly is that uh, revenue that has been topped up by customers, especially in prepaid, what is it being used on? Is it being used on uh, prepaid or postpaid? Is it uh, uh, data? Is it incoming or outgoing activity? When we talk about uh, the first KPI minutes of use, we are basically looking at how many total minutes each particular customer has been able to generate from um, their top up or from their usage. This is uh, reported by prepaid and postpaid and also then aggregated. And then we have uh, uh, different uh, legs of usage now. We have incoming and outgoing. Uh, incoming is those calls that you receive from other customers who are paying. And then outgoing is the calls that you set up on your own and they go out. So those two uh, together, because there is also the element of interconnect revenue or anything else, you might find that you also have to account for that revenue and usage uh, differently. Then you have uh, in the era when we used to have a lot of SMS, we also had uh, to track the number of SMSs that were outgoing or incoming on a particular line. And then um, uh, overall, uh, there's also the percentage airtime capacity utilization. So this is um, looking overall at any particular site or uh, within a 24 hour period how many of those uh, how much of that time that the site or the network is available is being utilized by customers you might find that uh, uh, as early as midnight there's some calls that are done it drops off slightly and then starts picking up at 5 a.m it shoots up again uh, slightly around uh, mid-morning and then tapers off until midday and then drops and then shoots up again somewhere around 4 to 5 p.m. And then you have uh, sort of uh, uh, a, a double or triple trough depending on uh, what you're looking at in terms of uh, the utilization. So all this is tracked and uh, we are speaking about thousands of uh, sales, we are speaking about thousands of uh, sites and you multiply by that, that's uh, gigabits of data that are analyzed and then trended and then presented and viewed uh, by marketing teams, uh, by network teams, and uh, all the other different departments that are in charge of just ensuring that the business is performing accordingly. And then um, in terms of uh, number of calls, so this is basically the count of calls, and then you can uh, also average it to calls, number of calls per subscriber. You find in high utilization networks, uh, you have as many as uh, more than 10 calls per day. And then you find uh, those that are idle, maybe they only make one call per day, maybe because they live far from where there is network and they have to cycle just to make one important call and come back. But all that behavior and understanding of what customers uh, are doing and what drives them to actually behave in that way is monitored and tracked by marketing departments that are actually in charge of ensuring that they're managing all the different segments that we've been speaking about so far. Then you also have roaming minutes at international minutes. Um, on the far right is basically some data usage um, KPIs. So um, a KPI called daily active users is basically, for instance, um, to give a cool example, is uh, how many people on daily basis are using an app or accessing Facebook.
So as long as the, a person is logged in and they perform one particular activity, that counts as uh, one day of use. And then within that daily usage, you find that some people don't log in every day. Some will do it weekly, others will only do it monthly, others will do it maybe once or twice in a year. So when you aggregate that information, you come up to the monthly active users. By tracking these particular two KPIs, you can tell by performance where traffic actually goes, uh, where there is no traffic, and then you can deep dive further, speak to customers or just understand the trends of what's driving that behavior so that you come up with the initiatives. So then we would come up with things like free Facebook. So then you see more people start using Facebook and uh, they might use the free version, which is not high quality. And then once they get into the habit of it, you find the transition to using the one that's paid for. So those are some of the use cases and uh, some of the ideas around how some of these KPIs actually influence uh, decisions. And then uh, you have uh, device segmentation. So under device segmentation, you can split again based on the operating system, whether it's iOS, Android, Windows, etc. You can also split by screen size. You have small screens, you have uh, large screens, you have touch screens, you have uh, non-touch screens. And you also have by network type, as far as 5G, 4G, LTE, and the like. There are all these different ways in which you can aggregate the data so that you come to an understanding of who are your customers before you make decisions or anything like that. So if you imagine you are uh, struggling with um, data revenue and you want to increase it, you might go and find uh, an affordable smartphone that you can launch in the market and say its uh, price will be so affordable, then you would then analyze whether or not it's a 4G phone or, and the like. So even in the positioning and the targeting of customers, you mention those particular attributes of the product and how much data they're going to get every month, whether it's free data or, or the plan. And that information as marketing team is packaged and then communicated and you see or hear it on the radio. And then you then say, oh, okay. So this is how uh, a BI uh, or data-driven business actually operates. They actually start by analyzing the data, come up with a solution, and then onwards, they start product managing and on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Then, uh, of course, there is data revenue and data app as well. So you, instead of just uh, tracking um, revenue on voice, you can split out the revenue that is being generated just purely from data and then use that as well to uh, look at the number of customers that you have to come up with a data app, which can also be tracked uh, daily, weekly, and monthly. Okay, um, I just thought I should also point out uh, quality of service and quality of experience because um, some of the applications are not so the ones that um, you see in the media or you hear marketing people talk about. So what happens is um, as um, networks have evolved, uh, there are many ways and means of measuring um, service performance, network congestion, uh, connection establishment, accessibility, uh, connection maintenance, service quality, and network availability. So whether you are using voice data, you are going to experience some of these particular KPIs as a customer. Is your phone fast? Is the network fast? Uh, is um, where you are on that particular location uh, a good connection? Or are you in a mobile, uh, yeah, are you mobile or are you stationary? Are you in a building that's got uh, concrete and maybe the signal there is poor? So some of these KPIs are collected uh, in the back end alongside the ones that have to do with customer numbers and revenue numbers or usage patterns. And these are used by uh, network performance engineers as well as uh, those managing IT applications to just ensure that they are delivering on the quality of service which uh, is measured and also enforced uh, by Zikta. So you find, uh, for example, um, call setup success rate. This is basically each time you pick up a call, do you actually get through on your first attempt? And uh, the key uh, uh, or the uh, standard worldwide is that at least 95% of those calls should go through. 
So when you do hear network complaints or when people are actually complaining, it uh, basically means that uh, this number has fallen be uh, below the threshold. And usually uh, the engineers have uh, a network operating center with screens for all the different sites and across the entire network. So they will already know this and they will already be fixing it. And usually the only uh, catastrophe would be that maybe a lot of uh, failure points have occurred and then there's a, an emergency and then it becomes now marketing's job to issue a message and say, we are experiencing network problems, please bear with us, we are fixing. Or if um, it's fixed quickly, but it was noticeable, then you immediately issue an apology so that customers are either not aggrieved or if not an apology, maybe you give out, uh, say, five free minutes the next day for off-peak use or something just to make sure that your customers are happy because um, the quality of experience is actually a reflection of uh, your customer satisfaction index as well. And then you have uh, core drop rates. Um, these also must be minimized. And then also the waste affected cells. So these are also tracked just to ensure that you are monitoring service quality and network availability across all the different network types. So uh, nowadays you find uh, sites are now bigger and uh, more aggressive. So previously they would have just a 2G and 3G cells. Now they've got more uh, different cells, 4G and some other places they've been testing 5G already. So imagine all that data is aggregated, uh, pushed to data warehouses, and it's also been analyzed and uh, uh, inputted into other data visualization tools that then uh, present this information to engineers and present this information to management teams. So all this is happening across uh, prepaid, postpaid uh, data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if I if I can take any burning question then uh, we can discuss uh, in the last few minutes. All right, uh, excellent uh, presentation. And, and I, I mean that sincerely, Travis, by the way, because um, I, have not, I have not really doubled in, uh, in the telecom sector since I left in, in 2011. It was to the late 2010, actually. So it's been a while, it's been 22, or 12 years rather. And, and I see quite, quite a lot has, uh, has happened, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to reserve some of, some of my random thoughts that I was taking in auto for later. Um, we we'll invite questions from our colleagues. I see there's already a hand up from Christopher. Please go ahead. Thank you, Doc. Um, and, and thank you, Travis, for, for that wonderful uh, presentation. I wanted to find out, um, I, I, I thought that the, the presentation focused on the data that you are getting uh, from your from your network from your customers is there an opportunity to get data outside of the network yeah so with the future of um Telecoms. Or may, or, may, or, or maybe what I, I maybe to make it clear, um, in terms of like a telecom company, what as opposed to getting data from from your network, you try to find out from outside of your systems what it is that you are missing out on. For for example, maybe there could be a group of um, potential subscribers who are not yet interacting with you. Um, maybe you could be in a location where there are wealthy people who are not yet on your network, for example. Um, how, are, are there any KPIs that look at um, things that are, that look at, for example, if it's subscribers, look at potential subscribers who are not yet generating data for you. And okay. so that would, that would um, also apply to the other parameters. So 
uh, from, from what I got, which was comprehensive and, and, and well done. So you are generating data as you interact with your subscribers and as you get new subscribers. And out of the different parameters that, you know, the, the different data sets that you, the, from the data that you're generating, you are making decisions. But there is some um, data that is, in a country, for example, like ours, it's a, it's a big country, with, is it close to 20 million people? So you only have a fraction um, of, of, of those who are on your network. Um, and you can, you can have KPIs that are built on those people that are on the network, on the network and, and the data they are generating. But are they specific APIs, KPIs, sorry, um, that, that focus on, on the unknown, the things that you do not know? Um, yes, definitely. That, that, so to answer, to answer your great question, um, the, let me just clarify the essence of the presentation. So a lot of the data and KPIs I was mentioning is basically CDR based. So the CDRs are the files that are generated while customers are using your network. However, um, that's because of the audience I was talking to, which is uh, business intelligence, data analysis, uh, data scientists, and uh, also computer science students. However, if I was talking to marketing students, I would also include in here KPIs that have to do with, um, like you mentioned, we start by saying um, what is the actual total population of this country or this area or this particular town. Then we uh, estimate the number of people uh, using uh, site, satellite imagery to estimate what potential customer numbers we can expect if we build a site there. And further on, we want to know what people actually think of things like our brand, uh, what they think of um, the customer satisfaction when they're using, what they think of when they are going to uh, your stores, and all those different data points are collected through market research. And uh, lucky for me, my first uh, job entailed that I also did market research, which is uh, grouped under consumer insight. So we used to get uh, insights on uh, existing customers uh, potential customers, uh, potential areas uh, would also get uh, uh, information on competition, would also get information uh, with regards to what's actually happening in the world globally and where can we take our business in terms of shaping um, the products, shaping the experience and shaping how we actually uh, use uh, some of this just internal CDR based data to come up with uh, marketing plans. Uh, so I uh, hope I've answered the question. Yes, you have, thank you. So uh, I, before we take more questions, uh, I was going to be blind here, Travis, and ask, that was a wonderful question, by the way, Christopher. I would ask to say, do, do these MNOs sell, they, do they trade data? Like, like for instance, I, I would like to think insurance companies might be interested in some of the data generated by these MNOs and perhaps MNOs might be interested in data from insurance companies. You know, I get strange calls these days, and I know my data is being traded by somebody. Whether this has endorsement from the MNOs or not is inconsequential, but I know that, that most of these weird calls that I get uh, as a direct result of my data being sold off somewhere. Do you do, you do that? Uh, and uh, to be more precise, actually, would information from, let's say, an insurance company or insurance companies be of any use to an MNO? Yes. So I'll start with the last part of your question. Um, if you look at the last bullet point I have there, there are actually initiatives that are being thought of and being created at a global level of data pooling. So as long as customers consent, and uh, they are well aware that uh, they will be receiving third-party communications. Uh, for instance, you might sign up for something from Microsoft, and then you consent that you receive communication from a partner of Microsoft um, that maybe sells a different product. So those are actually things that can happen. Then in terms of Zambia, I'm not aware of any uh, such data sharing agreements, but you find that um, of late, um, 
we have been interacting with a lot of applications that are integrated. So you might have an Airtel Money account, and then uh, one day you use it to pay for Zesco. Uh, Zesco will sort of have that information about you, and maybe Zesco will call you with something. Or the, you might um, uh, you pay for um, insurance with mobile money, and then the guys keep that information and then come and call you a day later and say, uh, are you still interested? Or if they're a bank, they would uh, uh, check uh, your mobile money uh, or mobile banking application usage and then come and offer you a loan. So those are sort of things that are able to happen, but they are also regulated by the likes of Zikta because uh, of data sharing or data protection. And now those are laws in Zambia and cybersecurity. So you have a lot of considerations. So uh, you might be the smartest uh, people around and doing this to customers, but there are also laws that are there in, in place for checks and balances. I think we can take uh, one more question and then I can finish off. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, Paul has a question. Thank you, Doc, and good evening, uh, Travis. Uh, my question is um, I'm just a bit uh, uh, wowed by the amount of data that you were handling. I just wanted to find out uh, uh, what methodology you were using to help you manage this data and disseminate it. Okay. <laughs> so, Lighton will keep me honest. So, it's a lot of Excel. And um, a lot of Excel and in terms of methodology, there's no one single method that um, you can say works. So to help us um, get this data, the likes of Lighton would be running the more advanced um, databases with uh, Excel or uh, you know, SQL applications and the like. And then they would pull this data in a usable format for us to actually manipulate it in Excel. And then uh, we sort of pick that data and summarize it and pick up um, the numbers that we needed to present to management. And then it will probably end up uh, in a PowerPoint or in a much more summarized executive uh, look for management. And then you go and present how those numbers are actually looking on a daily, daily basis uh, and decisions are made or you are encouraged to continue doing what you're doing or to start thinking of uh, what's next after this. And then in terms of um, other things that have now much pretty much evolved, you find that um, um, you can now actually uh, warehouse your data in a more cost-effective way with cloud storage and the like, and then point that data to a visualization program, say Tableau uh, or Power BI, and then that sort of powers a dashboard that people can actually just log in and view on a daily basis because it updates in near real time. And then you also have um, the ability now to export to PDF or to PowerPoint when you want to go do a presentation, which sort of cuts the time and the effort required for you to actually work on the data. So there's no uh, one single silver bullet that was there. Back then, there were all up tools that uh, sort of connect directly to a database, and then you drag and drop stuff in uh, a web browser or in Excel, and then you use that to actually support your decision making or the data that you are looking for. And then nowadays, there are even more advanced um, solutions that uh, if you sort of automate, you sort of killing 90% of the jobs that, are, that used to be there, say, 10 years ago. Great. Uh, Thank Travis, you very much. I, uh, I know you are probably in a rush here. Are you able to accommodate maybe three or four more questions? Uh, just, they'll be brief. We'll ask uh, the, the, the people that have their hands raised to be brief. Like I said earlier. Uh, 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 we, can, we can always uh, uh, free flow. So... I'll be yeah. mentioning, this is my last slide, so I'll be mentioning some of uh, what I've put here uh, as yeah. I answer the questions. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Boyd. All right, uh, thank you so much for the powerful presentation. Uh, I will be as precise as possible. My question is on the, net, on the network performance. Uh, there are cases where uh, uh, the, uh, 
the data flips from uh, 4G to 3G. So is that on the part of the transmission antenna or the, 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 the type of uh, device uh, that uh, is being used by the client? Thank you. Okay, so I will just play the role of uh, a marketer trying to educate a customer here. So I will not be technical. The answer, the simple answer is uh, your device has antennas that communicate with a cell tower. So it wants to pick the most optimal signal that you can get. So you might be uh, in a 3G, 4G area, and then uh, your 4G say covers a kilometer, and then your 3G covers 1.2 kilometer. So within the margin of era, at any one of those two points uh, where the networks um, are different, the net your phone will pick the most optimal connection. And then, even in terms of um, even in terms of um, how your device is captured within the the CDRs, it will show whether it was a 3G or a 4G connection, which helps uh, engineers optimize. So that means that, for example, a use case would be that maybe they expect that um, that particular radius should be a thousand uh, meters, a kilometer, and they find that uh, most of the connections are just above 800 are not working according. So they'll send engineers there to do a test drive with devices that actually mimic the way customer behaves and drive around, and then they'll isolate the problem spots and then fix it or optimize the network as fast as possible so that they reach that 1,000. Remember, they also buy equipment from elsewhere, whether it's uh, Ericsson, Nokia Siemens, and they are promised that this is what they'll get. So they will look at that and make sure that they are maximizing the capacity of that particular site and they will fix it, not just from the engineering point of view, but fixing it so that it improves the customer experience and they are less complex. Right, uh, I think Jacob and then, uh, sorry, Christopher, we're gonna put you towards the end because we've already asked a question, we'll prioritize the people that haven't. Uh, please, Jacob, do you want to? I'm, I'm not sure if Jacob is able to ask his question. If if not, maybe we can transition to Timothy and then we'll go to Gilbert. Hey, me. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Oh yes, we can hear you now. Oh, all right, okay. Uh, thank you, Trevor, for that wonderful presentation. It was uh, nice, especially with the layout of a simple presentation, but had a lot of information. I've got two questions. The first one is, uh, in terms of, I think this Paul already asked, but just to amplify it a bit, uh, when you, are, you said you're using Excel for your methodology, is there a generic way in which you think can work best based on your experience? Uh, because this is a data mining class. Are there any benefits that we can learn from your experience in terms of the challenges that we have that we can leverage on when coming up with such uh, consultants or such data presentation? That's one. Then secondly, on the churn, is there a correlation that you have seen between quality of experience, uh, quality of service, and also the churn that you are the clients are leaving the network is there a correlation on that one thank you okay so uh, to answer the first part um what usually tends to happen is uh over time um, um the bi specialists the marketing people start developing means and tools uh to actually mine data faster so that means, um, for instance, um, one day you might find uh, Lighton is writing 10,000 lines of code and joining 20, 50 tables together. And then uh, that line of code, for instance, takes two, three hours to run. And then um, marketing is under pressure to deliver and change something or, or, or respond to competition. And then over time, Lighton goes home, goes on YouTube, 
reads some somewhere else, finds a different way to code, and then reduces those lines of code and the effort by a certain number. So whatever you, whatever happens, say for instance on the database side, um, especially on the purely technical aspects of data mining, uh, impacts commercial very much because uh, whatever is realized there in terms of efficiency or effectiveness translates to marketing getting their information quicker and then in a usable format. A usable format is uh, mostly Excel because of uh, obvious reason it's the most uh, easy to, to use. But uh, over time, um, each operator sort of contracts their own providers. So you find the likes of IBM would have um, an, uh, a, a tool that um, links directly to the databases and uh, people are able to pull reports in a self-service uh, uh, platform. Uh, you find um, you can have um, a data warehouse that connects to publishing tools like uh, Power BI for those that want to just run quick reports that are already predefined at the back end. And then, so there are many different ways uh, to actually uh, achieve your objective. As long as um, your objective is clear, as you're saying, you're looking for information about minutes, you're looking for information about customers, you're looking for information about location or device, uh, that information is there and it's been uh, generated and accumulated uh, every second. Then on the second question, uh, chain is a really multi-dimensional uh, thing to uh, actually work with. Um, having worked mostly on the early days of Airtel when they came to Zambia, we had very basic campaigns that would run every week and would pull data every week wait for days to check this and that but now you find this information now has become sort of um, uh, well built in terms of trend you can actually predict uh, where quality of uh, experience quality of service uh, whether it's a network outage it will generate an activity whether it's for a few hours for a number of days or for for good because someone might even make a decision, a snap decision there and then to say, I'm tired of this network. I'm dropping this SIM card. I'm going to buy another one. They might even go and buy another device if, say, it doesn't allow them to, do, to use a router. I think most of you have had that experience, especially when it came to the, the early days of uh, the pandemic when you actually needed um, a device that actually works because you have to generate income or you have to attend school and you can't miss those particular things. So customers actually make decisions, uh, not just based on um, logic, but also the emotional state in which they are. So if their experience is quite bad, you might lose that customer. So the risk that you have to bring them back means that now you have to throw more discounts at them to actually keep them uh, with you. Then uh, the other correlative factors are usually uh, financial reasons. Financial reasons is basically I was able to afford um, to stay online or stay connected uh, the entire month. Now, for one reason or another, if I lose my job or a source of income or I have to scale back on spending, then I might forgo some services. And uh, other financial reasons could be that uh, you actually upgrade out of something. So, for instance, if you were um, on prepaid, and then you get a bigger job where they pay a bill for you at the end of the month. You probably stop using your prepaid card and migrate to postpaid. That doesn't mean, for instance, maybe we've lost you completely. Maybe you you switch to another operator or you stay within some operator. But there are so many reasons that actually generate migrations or uh, drop-offs. And you have uh, external reasons. External reasons are things like uh, if I were, for example, to move from Lusaka and I go and start living in Chongwe. In Chongwe, there is only MTA in that particular area. I'll immediately chain to another uh, operator. Uh, if, um, for instance, I get married, I don't want a certain number of people to contact me anymore, I go buy another SIM card. Then it means it has changed. I will still be active in the best, but I'd have changed the other one. So that counts towards the chain. So there are 
Also, these other different things like um, the device is damaged and you're no longer able to use your phone. So if you are a smartphone user, maybe you drop off and start using a basic 2G phone or you completely drop off for a week or a month until you buy a new device. Um, so forth and so forth. So a lot of the factors compounded together means that there is no single medicine that you give to a customer. You sort of um, throw this, that, that, you see which one sticks, and then based on what sticks, um, you then start applying um, whatever learnings you are picking up from the data to adjust course accordingly. So for instance, uh, the top up uh, versions of campaigns work very well because you basically tell somebody, top up this now, or buy this now, will give you this extra. And they'll immediately respond because they'll see it immediately. Um, then you have uh, things that are more complicated to run. You can tell a customer, uh, come and swap your phone, we'll give you a better phone. But that means they have to incur the cost of moving from wherever they are to come to your store. They have to endure the weight in the store. They have to um, forego this and that that they're used to. So there are so many different things that you can think of and so many different applications that this data actually allows you to do. But it all depends on what actually is driving your biggest chain. If what's driving your biggest chain is actually uh, quality of experience, the numbers definitely show. Every day you get a report uh, in the morning that shows you that your revenue was below your daily average. Then you start knowing that this trend will continue if the network or the, uh, the IT applications are not fixed, because all these are interlinked systems that actually need just to deliver mobility, connectivity, as well as any other services that are offered on the network. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, if I can just piggyback on that, just uh, because tied to the data mining thing, I'm curious, right? Um, so, Let's say you generate a chain report. Uh, I don't know how often this would be done. Let's say it's done on a monthly basis. And for a given month, you have, let's say, maybe 100,000, well, maybe 1,000 people um, that have just you know, left the network. Are there, are there ways of knowing exactly like why someone would have left? Is there a way of knowing? Or, uh, I mean, sure, knowing, whether, knowing how many people have left is one thing, but finding out specifics or trying to have an idea as to why people would have left. Is there, is there a way of doing that? Or do MNOs actually do that? Uh, if they do, do you think that there's an opportunity to, to kind of like aut automate that process by building some sort of inference model, taking into account some of these things that you've mentioned, say maybe somebody might have moved it to Chongwe and you know, maybe there's no 4G reception or something for that network? Okay. So in one of the applications, which is the predictive analytics, um, you sort of um, aggregate activity levels. You sort of start uh, looking at things like, is there amount to see usage? Is there, um, uh, for instance, do I have a dual SIM phone? Um, you can put in all these variables so that you start predicting your chain better. So that will, uh, new school of thought is mostly technology driven and um, it's got implications for AI, it's got implications for machine learning, uh, it's got implications for predictive analytics. So it's very internal data that you're looking at and then using that those data points to actually uh, predict. But you can also have uh, the old school methodologies that are there. You simply as a marketer, cannot afford not to walk through the life that your people live. So if you are seeing that your students are chaining, there are not so many universities in Zambia. So imagine you just sample and say, I'm going to go with um, five universities and I'm going to go speak to, um, I'm gonna, going to speak to uh, students. You spend a day uh, talking to students you pick up a lot of uh, quantitative data that means speak to 10 students. 
if there are two or four of you, speak to 10 students. What are they saying and what are they using? If you want to pick up qualitative data, now pick up on the reasons. Is it because uh, the network in his room is very bad? Is it because uh, he found an offer with competition? Is it because uh, his girlfriend influenced him to move to another operator so because they've got an offer? Uh, there are all these different dimensions and once you are picking up that information as a marketing team, you can use market research, you can also, for market research, you can have qualitative questions where you bring people into a room from different um, demographic groups, ask them the same questions. Um, also, you can send out people with questionnaires, they talk to customers, pick up this data, it filters through brand health tracking, it filters through uh, usage reports, it filters it through to your customer satisfaction, and you point all these data points in, on, you beam them across one screen, and the different minds within any uh, decent MNO will always come up with um, um, promotions or initiatives that should run in accordance with what you are hearing customers tell you. Thank you so much. Excellent. Uh, I think there's Timothy with a, with a hand up. Uh... Hello? Uh, am I audible? Oh, yes, you are. Please go ahead. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so the, my, my, my main question, I think, was asked by Jacob, the first one. You said you use Excel for your uh, data manipulation. I was curious. Uh, my, my background is a bit of BI and uh, data, uh, the databases. So I was looking at the limitations that come with Excel especially when it comes to the integrity of the data, because, you know, Excel will accept anything and everything as long as you've imported it. And um, uh, how scalable is, is it? Because if you are, you are talking of CDRs, so I'm imagining that that's a lot of data, I know for sure. Uh, CDRs, just even for a few numbers, is quite a lot of numbers. Uh, sorry, it's quite a lot of data. And uh, you're using Excel to manipulate that even security wise so i just wanted to know if there are tools out there specifically which you guys are using uh for that other than excel or which ones would you recommend currently yeah. okay so my my point was that um, um a lot of the data manipulation and processing cdrs so that you actually pick up information to do with customer numbers um, activity, usage, and the like, is handled and processed uh, in the back end on your various IT platforms. And then it allows us to pull what we can in a usable format into Excel, which you can then manipulate. And then I mentioned to say, now you have um, applications like Tableau, Power BI, um, you have, uh, other software as a service uh, applications that uh, basically can tell you um, or present this data in a much quicker way, process this data, and you then sort of start creating templates and the like that simplify your life so that uh, it becomes easier for you to actually um, go and say, I have all the site data for a country and they can just input uh, the minutes in one column and it will then give me a total at the end of the day. So basically that was my uh, sort of explanation. So it's not an easy world to be the guy that does analytics, especially if you are sitting in marketing and everyone is dreaming about all the KPIs and the different ways you can do it, but it's actually doable and there are tools depending on your budget uh, you can buy uh, uh, private jet level applications or just basic applications that can do most of what you need. Okay, no, no, thanks, thanks, thanks. All right, uh, we'll go to Barbara and then we'll wrap up with uh, Christopher, I think, uh, in terms of your hands up. Um, good evening. Um, mine is a... Um, Another question that I think has been already answered. 
So, oh, Barbara, I don't know if you can hear us. Your connection is. Uh, but then I just wanted to or, find out that the type of device being used. Hello? So, your connection is a bit muffled. I don't know if you can maybe just try and. Uh, I don't know if there's something wrong with your microphone or it should be a microphone, I think. Oh. Are you able to get me now? Hello? Uh, yeah, we can. Yes. Okay, I, I, I actually got my uh, my question answered as you were trying to explain, but then I just want. Yeah, the fine now. Yeah, your connection. Sorry, your connection is still bad. I don't know if it's just me, but I think it's really bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we will we will ask Barbara to maybe write down the question and then we we'll forward okay, to to Travis because your connection I think is is bad, and then we'll wrap up with uh, Christopher. Thank you, Doc. Um, just a quick one. Uh, in the presentation, obviously, there is a um, huge a number of parameters that we are we are following up on um i my question was if at all there is a mode of some sort if if there is and i believe that there is a hierarchy in terms of the the value or the weight that they bring um when you look at those different kpis i was wondering if there is some sort of uh, like a single metric if they, you know, like if they all line up to some single metric or a set of metrics that are representative of how a mobile network operator is, is operating. So the, you have like 1,000 different things that you're following up. Is there some mode where you, they, you know, they line up to some single metric or maybe not in a single metric, but, but a set of some, some you know, some, some, some number of some sort that you know maybe can even be computed in mathematically. Mm. Okay, that's it. That's an easy and a tough question at the same time. Mm. So, so basically, every business sort of has a, a culture of how they look at data and how much data they look at and how fast or they make decisions or how fast they respond to things like competition or new opportunities. So ultimately the number one KPI that keeps the lights on is revenue, pure and simple. Without revenue, you, you probably be investing by acquiring customers or growing. But at the end of the day, uh, every management team gets asked how much money they're going to make and when they will actually break even. That's your KPI. So in terms of a model that can actually predict this or in terms of just having um, a hands-on approach, uh, most of uh, the businesses develop uh, sort of dashboards where they say these are the numbers that we need to close the watch and on a daily basis we're going to have a meeting about customer numbers, revenue numbers, and usage, uh, as an example. And then uh, to make matters even more complex now, um, all the MNOs now have uh, uh, mobile money, which adds on its own complexity of KPIs that have to be monitored, because those are transactions of real money that people actually are using. So to put it plain and simple, there is no single model and uh, there is only one kpi that matters which is the revenue because the revenue determines how much you are going to invest in your it infrastructure to build uh, whatever uh, tools that you need to actually run uh, the business it determines how much you're going to invest in your network uh, are you going to invest in 4g or 5g are you able to do that uh, profitably uh, it depends. It also determines how much you're going to invest in your promotional activities, in your product development, in your people itself. 
because uh, to hire engineers, to hire people in marketing, to hire any one of those competencies, you have to offer competitive salaries. So the the best people will probably be working for where the the pay is actually competitive, and to do that requires revenue. So it all boils down to revenue, and uh, the best predict uh, the, the best predictor of who wins and who doesn't win in these markets is just usually based on the quality of the leadership um, or the management, the quality of data that they're able to uh, get. Sometimes it might not be the best quality, but are they able to make uh, good decisions? Good decisions does not always mean 100% of the time that uh, they make the right decisions. Sometimes it just simply means asking the right questions, interrogating your data, and then responding accordingly. Uh, in the one-off chance that you are able to beat competition or succeed, then you can say that uh, whatever you're doing is actually working and you can continue. All right. Uh, wonderful talk. I guess we can, we can end at that. Um, uh, I just have two things I wanted to raise, Travis. Uh, one of them is a question. It's, I'm trying to see if I can tie it to what we discussed in the course. I was, I was looking at, uh, I was thinking about some of the things you raised in terms of how you go about segmenting a customer. Um, and my question is, in the event that you wanted to run a marketing campaign, are there ways, or do you already know, um, which of those different aspects you spoke about is more effective? Like, for instance, um, am I better off, you know, looking at uh, the segmentation of the customer relative to the activity? Um, or perhaps I would, I, would, I would have better luck if I look at the demographic details, seeing as these days you have access to the demographic details about the, the customers, you know. Um, and tied to that, I mean, how, how detailed are these, is the segmentation process itself, you know. So do you, are there mechanisms in place that to drill down to the subscriber, like somebody like Lighton, to say, you know, a subscriber like Lighton uh, uses this much, a month and so for us to try and implicitly force him to use more this is what we should do and if so do you use you know sophisticated approaches right modern day approaches like machine learning and ai for instance yes so nowadays you find machine learning you find uh, predictive um, uh, advanced analytics being applied and uh, Usually marketing departments are sort of split into product management, people who do day-to-day -day operational things. And you also have uh, customer value management. Um, for instance, with one of my specialties, which essentially means managing the chain and the customer base. And then the combination of those two key areas in, um, in marketing sort of creates the segments that uh, a, a segment team works with. Uh, the segment team is also more like a consumer marketing team. They, uh, they take a business to consumer approach, a direct to consumer approach, and say, we'll never to be able to talk to 5 million customers. So let's aggregate the data as much as possible and segment it to something that is actually actionable. Is this actionable by location? Is it actionable by value segment? Is it actionable by um, device type, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those different uh, uh, teams then work towards then picking out the, that mining the data from historical trends and then saying this historical data is saying this. So we need to create a business case to say if we inject this particular intervention at this point, it's going to give us or turn around this number at this other point. So the milestones sort of get defined along the way. So you might find an example of um, the building of uh, the product, uh, which became Ikari, was sort of starting with the basics. What, um, what can you build uh, that people can use on a monthly, weekly, daily basis? And then within there, you create options. And then once you use that data to learn how people were purchasing, what they were preferring, how they were using, uh, were they using more than once or not, 
then you apply other more advanced things like machine learning to start making sort of recommendations. So instead of uh, you uh, buying a weekly at seven quarter, it might recommend that you upgrade to something that's going to give you more minutes at 10 quarter. That is incremental revenue. So those particular fancy things and other more advanced things that happen and get decided in the back end are sort of now changing the way marketing is done. Because now it means that uh, inherently you must have uh, the ability to not just be creative when it comes to marketing things. You also have to be analytical and you also have to know, uh, for instance, how to build a business case that then gets approved so that you launch uh, that particular um, initiative. The business case should be able to tell you how many customers revenue uh, that you need to break even so that it makes, uh, you can say that there is a positive return on investment. And then over time, you also need to have the ability to be analytical, which means uh, not just the aspect of, I can say 10% to 12%, no. It means now you should be able to, ma uh, to marry all the different data points that I've mentioned in the examples, whether it's talking to customers, whether it's uh, doing research, whether it's reading, uh, numbers in an Excel sheet, whether it's uh, presenting or convincing someone uh, or negotiating for a particular uh, price point in a meeting. So that is that uh, you think of and you see other great companies do in the world, um, whether it's uh, uh, offering you an upgrade before you actually buy something, uh, say you're buying, you're buying a license on Microsoft. And then it tells you that you can actually pay for family and you will save $2 uh, and get more licenses. Those particular things are being done in the back end and you don't see them easily or sometimes you notice them on USSD. Uh, they come as push notifications or as SMSs, but uh, there are people in the back end that analyze this data, come up with uh, offers, come up with products and all these other different experiences just to uh, make sure that uh, Zambia is not a country where you can sort of say, uh, well, in other countries, when I went to Europe, I got this, or when I went to America, I got this. No. If you look at some of the things that we are able to do with the technology we have and the expertise we have with the country, those, these are some of the best um, performing products I can think of. And I'm talking about margins that are, in terms of percentages, way above what some of those companies that you see in the, in the modern world are able to produce. And it's all done right here within Zambia. Excellent stuff. Thanks a lot. So uh, I was, um, I was the second part I, I was about to raise that is tied to that question. And um, this is me or us, um, uh, extending an olive branch to you. So we've had some relative success, you know, collaborating with industry. Uh, more recently, we've, I have personally been working very close together with some students, very closely with uh, colleagues from the university teaching hospitals. And uh, so if, if there are, uh, I know some of these things, Travis will come up, I'm supposed to be meeting you soon, but, but, but I, I would like our colleagues enrolled into this course to be aware about this. If you have um, ideas that you'd want to experiment with. This is us telling you that we have the manpower. Typically students, both undergraduate and postgraduate students are supposed to do some sort of research towards the end of the year. So um, for, for the guys in Audi 57 foot one, for instance, very, very soon they will start going through the grooming process of trying to identify a topic. Um, and what has worked best for us in the past is, uh, you know, having somebody at UNSA play an active role of supervision and then somebody like you would come in with uh, your expertise, obviously just offer expert advice. It's not a lot of work, probably the same amount of time you'd be spending. I see you volunteer at Bongo Hive, for instance, that Bongo Hive women in tech uh, thing I just saw on your CV. Um, it would be nice. Um, and I know maybe some of the ideas you might have, you don't want them to go out there in the open because, I mean, your consulting firm is interested in making money, but if there's a way of carving out some of these problems in such a way that you can have, or we can have students work on them, um, it would be nice if we could uh, continue this conversation. I know there are people that would be really excited in 
working in this particular area. And in fact, to give you a bit of context, we had somebody, I've just shared a link there. We had somebody, um, is it before last year or something? Uh, Soft Muruiza it is, uh, who worked on a problem specific to uh, the telecom sector. But, but, but I think the reason he did that is because uh, he actually works in that particular sector. So it was a lot easier for him to cover out that problem. So not necessarily a question, but uh, food for thought. So hopefully maybe we can experiment with this and try and see if we can come up with a topic that we can, we can spin out of a capstone project or a master's, uh, a master's project. And it doesn't have to be something related to marketing. I know Travis had raised, uh, to me, by the way, you raised an issue uh, with uh, Pamela Chisupa, right? The mobile booth op operator was kidnapped or something. And I, th I remember your, your argument was, I mean, there's, obviously a lot of interesting things we can do, not just with CDRs, but perhaps with, with some of these CCTV TV cameras that we are seeing. That's another option, right? Uh, if you're interested. But I'll raise this issue with you when we meet, I think. We're supposed to meet on Friday or something. But anyways, uh, Travis, thank you so very much. We know you're a busy person, but uh, this, is, uh, this is good. This was wonderful. Uh, we normally share um, the recordings or the presentations online. I will reach out to you to find out if you, you'd be okay with us uh, making this presentation publicly available, um, in which case we will send you a link once that is done. So thank you so much, Travis. Really appreciate you taking the time off. Uh, also, thank you so much to everybody who managed to attend the talk. Really grateful. Um, all right, we are done. Uh, so for, uh, I don't know if you have anything to say, Travis, in closing. Uh, uh, well, just uh, it was a very engaging session, and I enjoyed uh, the questions that uh, were posed, and it gives me a good uh, food for thought of what else we could share with uh, academia in terms of uh, what actually happens uh, in the industry, and not just from uh, telco, but uh, what is the regulator doing, what are, what are the regulatory trends, what are, what's happening in terms of uh, numbers, we, whether we're looking at social media numbers or anything like that, and the implications of uh, what we can work on uh, collaboratively. So thank you everybody for the questions and uh, it was a pleasure meeting you all. All right, so we are done. I, I can boast that I, I know a lot of smart people in Zambia. But anyways, thank you so much everyone. Uh, those of you that are enrolled in 5741, uh, uh, there's a link um, to the class we're supposed to have. Uh, so we'll use that link for the, um, for the class that we're supposed to have. I'm, I'm saying we're supposed to have because I have an apology here. So I'll see you on the other side. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Doug.